أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم بسم الدين أما بعد as you can see the verses in front of you on the screen uh, from Surah Saf we are verses six seven eight and nine uh, for this session today uh, Allah subhanahu wa taala in verse number six uh, is indicating of Prophet Muhammad sallam being prophesized by the previous prophet of Allah, Isa ibn Maryam. So Allah is saying, "Wa izqala Isa ibn Maryam, ya bani Israel, inni Rasulullah ilaykum, musaddiqan lima bina yadayu min al-Tawrat, wa mubashiran bi Rasulin yati min ba'dihi ismuhu Ahmad." فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ قَالُوا هَذَا سَحْرٌ مُبِينٌ Allah SWT is telling us and remember when Isa ibn Maryam, Isa the son of Mary told the children of Israel يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ that I am a prophet of all you notice how as the Arab Mufassirin tell us that he does not say يَا قَوْمِ Rather, he says, Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, because that reiterates or stresses and emphasizes that Isa السلام, was not sent to a new qawm or a new people, or he was not sent to a new place. Rather, he was the last of the prophets for children of Israel. That same genealogy that started from Abraham continued all the way to Moses and then Jesus Isa ibn Maryam was the last prophet of the children of Israel and after prophet Moses he was one of the major prophets that came to the children of Israel and he is telling them inni rasulullahi ilaykum that I am a prophet of Allah to all of you all of the children of Israel Hence, this removes the notion of him coming for a new civilization or a new people, a new group, and reiterating that he is a prophet to the children of Israel. However, they did not accept him, and that is why we know how the Quran tells us the turn of events that happen in other places. But here Allah SWT is informing us that he told his people that I'm a prophet to you. And he's telling them, Musaddiqan lima min al-Tawrat. I am coming to reiterate or reinforce what you have from the Torah. Remember the Torah was a book that was given to Prophet Musa, Moses. So Musa alayhi salam brought the Torah. So Isa alayhi salam is saying that what I have been given, which is the Injil, is truthful it is reinforcing or re-emphasizing what the previous prophet moses brought in torah so in this ayah there are three things that jesus isa salam, is telling bani israel number one he's saying that i'm a prophet of allah to all of you to all of bani israel i'm not a prophet to a new people or a new group or a new cult Number two, he's saying that I'm bringing to you a holy scripture, holy of Allah, which is the Injil. And it, the Injil that I'm bringing, the gospel, it is confirming what the word musaddiqan lima bina yadayya min al-Tawrat is indicating that the Injil, the gospel that Isa al-Islam is bringing is not a new book or new law or new thing. Rather, it is there to reinforce, reconfirm the previous law, law of Moses that was given in the Torah. That's the second thing. His first duty is informing them that he's a prophet. His second duty is informing them that he is bringing a holy scripture, which is not different or deviant from the previous scripture that was given to the children of Israel and Israel, and that is the Torah. The third thing that he informs them, Bumubashiram bi Rasuli. And I am also a giver of good news. Mubashir from Bushra or Bashir means to inform, to give the good news, to give the glad tidings. 
And so he is giving them the good news that after me, there's going to come a prophet whose name is Ahmed. He's even giving the name. And that is why in the Torah and the Injil, they both informed their people about a prophet that's going to come towards the end of time from the brethren of children of Israel. Who are the brethren or cousins of the children of Israel? The cousins or brethren of children of Israel are the Arabs. Because Isaac or Yaqub al -Islam, oh, sorry, Ishaq, Isaac or Ishaq al -Islam, was one son of Ibrahim. And Ishmael or Ismail al -Islam, was the second or the, the other son. So the two sons, their progeny, their offsprings are cousins of each other. So the Bani Israel are the people, children and progeny of Ishaq al -Islam, and that lineage. The Arabs are from the lineage of Ismail salam, the other son of Ibrahim salam. And hence these people are related to each other because their lineage is going back to the same father, Ibrahim salam. So, he, so the Torah, Musa salam, and Torah also informed them that there's gonna come a prophet from your brethren, and that is Muhammad salam. In Injil, the gospel also, Isa salam, informing the people that there's going to come another prophet after me. I am not the last prophet. Yes, I am the last prophet to the children of Israel, but the last prophet on earth is going to be Muhammad or Ahmed, as is mentioned here. In a hadith, Rasul said very beautifully that, Inna li asma, that for me are names. And he goes on to say, Ana Muhammadun wa Ana Ahmadun wa Ana Al Mahi. What Rasul is saying in this hadith is that I have multiple names. Especially in this hadith, he gives five names. In this hadith, Rasul is giving five of his names. He says, my name is Muhammad, uh, and my name is also Ahmed, and my name is also Mahi. Uh, which is which means the remover of expiator or eraser, and I'm also al hajir the gatherer, that I'll gather people around on Yom Al Qiyamah, and I'm also al aqib the one who recollects people. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given many names to Prophet Muhammad Zulm, and one of the names that is mentioned here in the Quran in this ayah is Ahmed. Then Allah SWT goes on to say, This is in reference not to Isa alayhi salam, but now Allah is referring to Muhammad sallam and saying that when Muhammad sallam came with the clear proofs, the clear proofs by Yanad here, or clear evidence, refers to the Quran, the last and final revelation of Allah to Muhammad sallam. So Allah SWT here is saying that when Muhammad sallam came with the Bayanat, they said this is a clear magic, an obvious magic, meaning they rejected the Quran. And of course, the Jews and Christians living in Medina, they rejected this Quran from Muhammad Sallam and they don't accept it and rather call it magic and sorcery, just like the people of Mecca. Then in the next verse, verse number seven, Allah SWT tells us, Woman and who is more unjust, who is really more as of an oppressor than the one who invents a lie about Allah? And they call upon, uh, while he is being called towards uh, the truth, which is Islam. So here it's referring to the people who lied and said that no, there is no mentioning of Prophet. In fact, this ayah can be understood better in context of the verse in Surah Baqarah where Allah says that um, الْكَلِمَ أَمَّ They remove the words of the Holy Scripture from its places. Meaning what they did was, the Jews and the Christians, they removed the name of Muhammad Sallam from the Old Testament and New Testament, from the Torah and from the Injil, from the Gospels. And that is why Allah SWT is saying that those scriptures are no longer valid because they have been manipulated and changed. 
And what did they change besides many other changes that they made? One of the major changes they've made in their book was they removed the name of Muhammad. They removed the verses that indicated that there'll come a prophet towards the end of time. And the description that is given about Prophet Muhammad in those books, they deliberately, intentionally, purposely removed it because they did not want people to believe in that prophet. And they wanted to deny and belittle that. They, they lied. And that's, that's the lie that Allah is talking about here, that who is more wrong, who is more of an oppressor than the one who lies upon Allah and says that, no, God did not promise us any prophet towards the end. The last prophet is Isa ibn Maryam. Jesus is the last prophet. And that is what Allah is referring to as kathib. وَمَنْ أَذْنَ مِمَّنْ افْتَرَى لِلْكَذِبْ وَهُوَ يُدْعَى عَلَى الْإِسْلَامِ وَالْ They are being called. وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْذِي الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ Allah does not guide the people who are wrongdoing or oppressing. Here it refers to hiding the truth. That is the reason they tried to hide the truth. They feared the popularity or they feared the acceptability of Rasulullah as a prophet. And that is why they feared the loss of their status, their honor, their dignity, if they accepted Prophet Muhammad as a prophet. Mind you that there are many Jews and many Christians, even at that time of Rasulullah who accepted Islam and they accepted him as a prophet. And they knew that he is, a, when they realized and knew that he is a prophet of Allah, so they accepted him. But the staunch oppressors, the staunch uh, arguer people, they tried to remain um, adamant and stubborn on their context and pretext that no, he's not a prophet and never accepted him as a prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then in the next ayah, ayah number eight, connects to this philosophy of denying a prophet and belittling a prophet um, by the next ayah where Allah says that these people these people the people of the book they want to extinguish expunge erase the nur of Allah the light of Allah the suburb of nuzul or you can say the reasons of revelation that goes behind this is that there was a pause in the coming of the wahi to Rasulullah. So these people began propagating or publicizing the message that look, the wahi has stopped to the Prophet, peace upon him. Therefore, he is false, he's not true, and there's no more revelation coming. It was just a bad dream or a bad thing that happened. It's not a reality. So they wanted to crush the message of Quran, Islam, and Rasulullah the Prophet. So that is when Allah SWT revealed this ayah to show them the desire, the people of the book desire or wish. They want to. يُرِدُونَ لِيُطْفِيُ نُورَ Allah. They want to extinguish the light of Allah. The nur of Allah over here refers to the Quran and the teachings of the Quran and the values of the Quran and the message of the Quran. Because remember, they don't accept the Qur'an to be a book of God, book of Allah. Why? Because if they accept the Qur'an to be a book of God, book of Allah, guess what? Automatically then they have to accept Prophet Muhammad as a prophet. <clears throat> because we know for a fact it's a very common known thing <clears throat> to all the people of faith that books of God or scripture of God do not come directly on earth to mankind. <clears throat> they always come through a prophet just like Prophet Moses and Jesus. So they never accepted Quran to be a word of God. And at the same time, likewise, they never accepted Prophet Muhammad to be a prophet. And they go both hand in hand, because if you accept the Quran to be the word of Allah, then you have to also accept that that word of Allah came through Prophet Muhammad and he's a prophet. But these people wanted to remove that, expunge that, erase that from society. And they, uh, did many acts for that and that is what Allah is referring to that their wishful thinking or their desire is to remove the nur of Allah, yutfi nur Allah with their tongues by belittling the Quran um, 
propagating false messages to people saying that he's not a prophet of God. This is not the book of God. Even till this day, people try um, their maximum to remove um, from society any kind of respect, honor, or allegiance given to the Quran or given to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But Allah says, Allah will establish itmam. The mutimmu comes from itmam, tamam, which means completion. Allah will complete his nur, meaning Quran. The Quran will be revealed, will be completed, will be established, will be um, manifest on earth. People will see the effects of the Quran, the revelation of the Quran. And they will see the teachings of the Quran implemented in society. So Allah is saying that He will make sure that the Quran is established and complete on earth. Even if the disbelievers dislike that and they don't want that to happen. In other words, this part of the ayah is referring to the tricks and treachery, the plots and planning that the people of the book did in order to extinguish the Quran, in order to remove the Quran from society. They tried to do tahrif, changes in the Quran, they tried to um, remove it, but Allah is saying that he has protected the Quran, like the ayah in Surah Hijr, Surah 15, inna nahnu nazzalna dhikr wa inna lahu lahafidun. Allah is saying, verily, we have revealed this remembrance, dhikr Quran, and we will protect it always. So in other words, Allah is saying that this Quran will be protected no matter what the enemies of Islam and the enemies of Allah, no matter what they want to do and establish and remove, Allah will continue to establish the Quran and make it manifest on earth. And that's why for all these 1450 years, Alhamdulillah, we have the Quran in its original form. And the most beautiful way that Allah has made this Quran protected and preserved is what we call Hifz al-Sudur. You know, it's protected in the hearts of the people. So anyone who tries to change the Quran or remove the Quran, the hearts, the hafaz, the memorizers, who memorize the Quran in their heart, they can always recite and tell people that this is the Quran, the Kitab of Allah. And that is what Allah is saying, Walau karih al -kafirun, even if they dislike that. Meaning they, uh, this ayah is similarly repeated in another uh, surah of the Quran where Allah tells us, Walau karih al -mushrikun. Um, even if the disbelievers or the polytheists don't like it, Allah will establish um, his nur, his kitab, his teachings on earth. And that is why one of the meanings of the word kufr means to hide, to cover up something after knowing the truth and haq. And that is what Allah Mazar is referring to over here. Um, that these people uh, are those who do not want to show the truth, which is also reiterated in the next ayah in ayah number nine. Allah says, Who will let the Arsala Rasulahu bil Huda? He is the one Allah who has sent his messenger, his prophet, with guidance, with Deen al Haq and the religion of truth or the way of truth. So that it is manifest over all, it leaves its imprint over all, it overpowers over all of the other uh, deen that are there. Because this is the last and final revelation, this is the last and final prophet, this is the last and final message of Allah SWT. So Allah SWT is making that manifest over the previous. Uh, scriptures and the previous people and inviting their other people to come and accept this message of Allah. Uh, even if the polytheist or the people who associate mushrik is someone who associates partners with Allah. So Allah is giving a clear indication to 
the Meccans, the pagan Arabs, and also the Ahli Kitab, Jews and Christians living in Medina at that time, that he will make sure that this religion remains established on earth and manifest and will never be um, removed and will never be expunged or extinguished, no matter what you try, no matter what you try to do, what kind of treachery and trickery and plots and planning you try to do, um, Allah will always be there protecting this kalam of Allah, protecting the message of Allah SWT, because this is Deen al Haq, the truth. Like Allah says in, the, in another surah in the Quran, in Surah Bani Israel, وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَذَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ ذَهُوكَ And say that Haq, truth has come and falsehood has perished or wiped away. Really, it was meant to be removed or right away completely. Um, and that is why. Uh, Allah is referring to his kitab, his Quran as nur, light. Light is something that gives guidance to people. Light, whether it's a candlelight or I want to say fire, which gives light, anything that gives light, it has a tendency or passage of time to diminish, to decrease. And whether a candle is running out of its thing, whether it's a a lantern running out of gas or whether it's a fire that is you know dwindling down and light is going out Allah is saying that this light light of Quran light of Muhammad light of Islam will never go out no matter what the enemies try their best to do why because Allah is on the back of it Allah is behind it and they can do whatever they want but they can never remove the light of Allah and the light of Muhammad on earth and the light of Islam. Uh, and that is what the word meaning of Mutim Nuri he is. It's Imam Nur, meaning that this light will continue to kindle, will continue to burn, will continue to show guidance to people. And that is very amazing, isn't it, my dear brother and sister in Islam, that today we live at a time of fitan and fitna around us. They are enemies of Allah who are trying their very, very best, level best, to defame Islam, to tarnish Islam, to malign Islam, to insult and humiliate Islam and Muslims everywhere, to propagate a propaganda, false propaganda against Islam and Muslims, to make the average human beings on earth hate Islam, hate Muslims, hate the Quran, hate the Prophet Muhammad, whether it's in the form of cartoons, uh, of Prophet Muhammad whether it's in the form of uh, um, demeaning the Muslims and showing that they are barbaric and violent and aggressive, um, whether they are in terms of creating false Qur'ans with calling it Qur'an or you know, in the last 10, 12 years we've seen many attempts by various different groups and people trying to malign the Quran and come up with some kind of new Quran and say that this is a revised, updated, new version of Quran, something that is better suitable for West. These are all examples of Hilat. Hilat, we say in Arabic, are tricks and treachery and plots and planning of the enemies of Allah, enemies of Islam. They try their best to, because their goal is to remove the effects of Quran from earth. Their mission or purpose of life is to remove the remembrance of Muhammad Sallam from every nook and corner of the world. And that is why Allah SWT is reiterating here, who He is the one Allah, meaning who is on the back of Muhammad Sallam, who is on the back of the Messenger of Allah Sallam, Allah. So well, that's why Allah said in another ayah in the Quran, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَ O Prophet Muhammad Sallam, we have raised your dhikr, your remembrance, meaning we have praised you. We have publicized you. There's no way that your name will be extinguished or removed. There's no way that your name will be maligned. And subhanAllah, somebody just recently texted or sharing on WhatsApp that in America, uh, the name Muhammad has become the top six. One of the top six names of babies chosen in this country is the name of our Prophet Muhammad Sallam. So these examples are indication of the manifestation of this ayah that Allah SWT is saying 
that no matter what they do, no matter how many cartoons they make against Prophet Muhammad no matter, no matter how many times they try to insult and humiliate with false propaganda about Prophet Muhammad the name Muhammad and the messenger Muhammad will continue to grow and further propagate till the end of time because he is the last and final messenger. And Allah is there to always protect and preserve him and his message, just like Allah is protecting and preserving his message, the Quran. Like Allah says in the Quran, Surah Ma'idah, Wallahu ya'asimuka min al-nas. O Prophet Muhammad Sallam, Allah will save you from the human beings. Even when he was alive, Allah saved him and protected him from the human beings. And even when he is not here on earth, Allah will, is still saving and protecting him. All those people who made Quran, uh, cartoons about him, all those people who made all kinds of defamation and bad things about him. Allah has taken care of them. Their lives are a clear manifest proof of how Allah gets back on those who try to hurt his messenger of Allah. So we see in this time and age, in this era that we're living, that Allah Taala is manifesting and implementing three things which are very dominant. Number one, his Quran, his message. The, the word of Allah. Number two, the messenger who brought the message of Allah SWT, Muhammad Sallam. And number three, Deen al This part of the ayah that it is saying that, you know, idhar means that this thing will go overpowering, meaning Islam will become so dominating and the most prominent thing in the world that people, even if the enemies of Islam who try to crush and suppress Islam, it will not. People will still get to learn more. And we see that the number of people who converted to Islam after 9-11 are far more higher, exponentially higher, compared to the number of people who converted to Islam before 9-11. So that just goes to prove how Allah SWT has his own ways of manifesting the proof and showing the people that how he will make sure that his messenger and his message is becoming prominent, and publicized in the world, whether me and you, brothers and sisters, we as Muslims, whether we fall short, we are weak, we are have shortcomings, we have weaknesses, we are not doing the job um, as we're supposed to, and yet Allah SWT has his own ways of implementing the message of Allah SWT in the society. So that brings us to the end of verse number nine, which was the last words for today. Inshallah, the first question um, regarding the name of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as Ahmed. Can you give us a little bit more insight into the meaning of this word? Does it mean one who praises Allah or does it refer to um, the one who is praised or does it have other connotations of the meaning praise? And can you also say a few words about when this name was started to be used? for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Was it used very early in his life or was it something that was started to be used later or, or after the Nubuat? Uh, so how can we better appreciate this name Ahmad so that we can get to know Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam better? Good question. Yes, the word Ahmad means the one who praises Allah SWT and like the word Muhammad means the praise one, those who praise him. And this was one of the names that was uh, uh, of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam was used in the later part of his prophecy, uh, once uh, just before the Hijra time to Medina. And the main, of course, we have to understand the main purpose of having multiple names is to show the universality of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam that he is a prophet to all of mankind and not just the Arabs or not just the people who are in, in a certain geographical continent. And uh, it is also to show that the root word is from Hamd, you know, praising. And so therefore, he is a man, a personality who praises Allah SWT and who is also praised by Allah SWT in the Quran and also those who praise him also uh, and his message and legacy around the world. Uh, the most prominent name, of course, is Muhammad. The other names are not that highlighted. 
and he was addressed by uh, uh, by his name as Muhammad. But yes, these other names are to show uh, the richness of Arabic language and also to show the qualities of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallam in different dimensions. Jazakallah. Um, was there anyone named Muhammad before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Um, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. I have to find out. Okay. Unless, unless somebody knows from the audience, then you can tell us. Uh, if you know, feel free to um, submit your answer in uh, in the in the questions tab. Regarding the verses about Isa salam foretelling the coming of our Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you talked about verses being um, changed in the um, Old Testament and and the Gospels. Can you review some tips with us on how we should interact with Jews and Christians with respect to discussing this topic in a, in the context of Dawah? You know, what verses should we be referring to in the Old Testament and the Gospels uh, on this topic? Uh, and how should we best address uh, discussions with uh, our fellow people of the scripture? Uh, the best answer for that is there's a book called Muhammad in the Bible, uh, written by a friend of mine. Um, I forget his name, but if you just do a Google search, it's available on Amazon. And he has given a detailed answer analysis of how to address this issue. So uh, everybody can just, you know, get that book and read directly. But my personal, um, you can say my personal opinion, my gut feeling is always not to talk about things that would in dawah because the questioner asked the word in the context of dawah so in dawah we're supposed to build bridges and building bridges can only happen when we talk about similarities and not differences because it irritates somebody when you tell them that look your holy book mentioned our prophet name but you guys changed it just think about it what kind of background and psyche would you then try to attract them to islam when you're already demeaning and degrading them Yes, the Quran is mentioning here that they change their book and everything and they change their name and remove the name. But using that as a tool of dawah, you would not, it is not wisdom, it is not wise to attract them to Islam. Because remember, the philosophy of dawah outlined in the ayah in Surah Nahl in verse 125, Allah SWT very clearly says, The first thing Allah used the word, the first quality over there is hikmah that call to the way of your Lord using wisdom. So it would not be wise to start off giving dawah to somebody on this context because they'll become very defensive. Rather, we should be talking about uh, Prophet Muhammad, his personality, his uh, likes, his habits, his lifestyle, his qualities, his characteristics, his features. You want to attract the person towards the personality of Muhammad that they become so um, uh, mesmerized or they become so attracted, incited to learn more about him. Because if I just start off with this pretext to that person, they're going to shut off their brain, they're going to shut off their heart. I would not like to endeavor in seeking more about the man and the message. So this is my personal strategy uh, in the field of Dawa that I advise all dies not to use that. But yes, if somebody questions us, somebody in the field of Dawa, you're talking to somebody, having a conversation, and they and they bring up this issue, then yes, you can tackle it head on. But I would not say to use this as the first line of tool of inviting somebody to Islam, because it would not fit right or sit with them properly in that context. Jazakallah khair. Was the name removed after the Prophet وسلم, became Prophet or was it before he was born? And this is referring to removing the name from the previous scriptures. Some of the riwayat say that it was before he was born and some of the narrations they tell us that it was after he was born um, because they knew that this Prophet is coming. So they had changed in it on the holy books. Okay. 
In uh, verse 7, um, which reads, And who is more unjust than one who invents about Allah and truth while he is being invited to Islam? And Allah does not guide the wrongdoing people. When we are discussing Islam with people from other faiths um, and they're rejecting our message, what should be our attitude towards them? I mean, in this verse, there is you know, a supposition that Allah is labeling certain people as wrongdoing people. Um, at what stage do we give up on that person or could we never give up on that person and continue to think of them as potential Muslims? We should never give up on anyone, regardless of who it is and what is there. Because the message of Dawah is very clear that this guidance is a guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning Allah opens the people's heart. We and guidance is only from Allah. Uh, so we cannot write off anybody, we cannot give up on anybody. Um, because we are only the carrier of the message, or we are the messengers of the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told in the Quran to his own messenger, Prophet Muhammad. Sallam, you, O Prophet Muhammad cannot guide even your own loved ones, your blood relatives, people you love and you want, your relatives. You cannot guide them. But Allah guides whoever he wants. And this aspect of the ayah is sometimes misinterpreted, misconceived, that Allah guides whomever he wants. What it really means is that Allah guides whoever wants to be guided. That's the better translation to be put. That Allah guides whoever wants to be guided. Today, you may be giving da'wah to somebody and they don't want to be guided. So you feel like, you know, rejected, rejected. You feel like you should give up on this person, but you don't. But you don't because the biggest uh, proof of not giving up is the example of Prophet Muhammad Sallam that till the death of his uncle Abu Talib, he did not give up. Even on the deathbed, he kept telling his uncle Please, please, uncle, accept this message. Just say it. Just say it. So he could have, you know, if, if, it, if giving up was something that was permissible and halal in Islam, he would have not done that at the time of death because he knows that, okay, it's too late. My uncle is dying. He's never going to convert. He's not going to be guided. But he never, ever gave up on anybody. Likewise, for us, in the context of this ayah, even though Allah is saying about it, that we should keep on trying and trying and trying to our level best until our last breath and should never give up anybody at the same time some people they misinterpret this ayah and they say oh allah is saying that the people are liars they're belittling the prophet they're insulting humiliating allah and his message and messenger so you should just give up on them you should retaliate against them or you should turn away from them that's not the case at all that's not what the ayah is saying the ayah is saying that understand your limitation, O human being, O Muslim. You are limited, you're restricted. You can try your best, but guidance is not in your hand. A lot of times we feel like when we're talking to somebody that they'll be guided through me, or that's it, they're going to take shahada, they're going to become Muslim, they're going to say the words through me. That's the biggest misconception of a human being. Um, we are not guides, we cannot guide people, and our efforts cannot even guide somebody. If the slightest thought comes to somebody's mind that, oh, I gave da'wah to this person and he or she took shahada, that's because of me. This is the biggest, biggest uh, poison of shaitan that he puts in the heart of a person. In fact, if somebody praises you that, oh, so many people are guided through you, we should be reading or reciting a istighfar and saying to our nafs that, no, it's all from Allah, nothing from me. It really, really surprises and shocks me when somebody gives shahada to somebody and then everybody starts praising that brother or sister, mashallah, because of you, they took shahada. Just that statement does not fit right with me when somebody says, because of you, somebody says, took shahada. No, not because of me or you or anyone. It's just because of Allah. It just happened so that Allah used us as a messenger, as a tool, as a device, as a mechanism, as a vehicle to deliver that message. To because Allah said in the Quran, even to Prophet Muhammad Sallam, and nothing is upon us, no duty or responsibility is upon us except balagh, which means spreading the message. Meaning we are not responsible for the guidance of somebody. And so when we are talking to somebody, we should not feel that why are they not accepting my message? 
hey, maybe it's not right. Maybe the time is not right for them. When the right time, the right place comes for them, they would be. Many times it happens that people give dawa to somebody and then they move on. They move to another state, go somewhere else. And many, many years later, that person who was approached by that person who moved on, later on accepts Islam. Will that person get a reward for that? Of course. Just because they moved on and they did not, you know, turn back and follow up with that person. But that person later on in life became Muslim. Somebody sowed the seed in them. So giving dawah is all about sowing a seed. And I always say this in the dawah training workshops, that hidayah or guidance is sowing a seed of curiosity in the person. Our job is only to make the person curious, to search, to keep finding and finding the truth until their heart comes to rest with the truth. In interfaith meetings, Christians talk about Jesus as the Son of God. How do we rebut this line of thinking? Very simple. We tell them what Allah says in the Quran, that he is not the Son of God. He is a messenger of God. Especially we can quote to them in our talks about the ayah in the Quran that Allah says, Masala Isa and the like a Masali Adam, Khalakom in Turab. The example of Isa in front of Allah SWT is like the example of Adam. They're both created from dust from sand. In other words, Allah is giving the parable simile that if you are addressing Isa to be a son of God just because his he did not have a father, then what about Adam who did not even have a father or a mother for that matter? It is Again, the strategy here that Allah is showing us to use uh, with these people is to provoke their consciousness, to incite them to think, think about what are they doing and saying and behaving and believing. Because nobody calls Adam the son of God. And then they equate both the prophets of, on a different pedestal, different level. They say, oh, no, no, that was the first human being and there was no human being at all. So yeah, he did not have a father, mother. that's okay. That's not the son of God. But when it comes to Jesus, just because the father was absent in the picture and only the mother was there, they automatically just, the other argument, counter argument they give is, oh, Isa is the, the kalam of Allah, kalimatullah, is the word of Allah, because that word was brought by messenger uh, Gabriel, angel Gabriel, he came and brought the word of Allah, and he just said, be, and it became, and she became, you know, pregnant. So therefore, they they use that sim that analogy to show that oh he is different he was he came into existence by just the word of God whereas God made Adam and then blew ruh into it later on so these are some of the ways and strategies that we can use to show in our interfaith dialogue that look we have to understand the opposite side of the spectrum they are stuck on one thing that son of God son of God son of God we need to bring them out of that paradigm and do a paradigm shift and say, look, look at it from a different perception, different vantage point. Why did God create Jesus, Isa, without a father? There must be a reason for it. Nothing happens without a reason. Everything happens with a purpose. And the purpose behind the creation of Isa was to show God's miracle to humanity that he can create life however he wants. And the most prominent thing that all Dayid should talk about when it comes to Jesus, Isa, is to show that Allah has four ways of creating life on earth. Number one, the first way was Adam, no father, no mother. Number two was Hawa or Eve, that there is only a male and from the male, the female is, cre is created. Meaning there was no female in the picture, which is directly uh, opposite of what Isa Islam was. Isa and Hawa are opposite. In the creation of Isa, there is at least a female in the picture, in existence. In the creation of Hawa, there is no female in existence. There is no mother or nothing. Rather, there was just the husband, the male in existence. So that's the second and the third way of creation. And the fourth way of creation is what we all know about when everybody has a father and a mother, from a male and a female, another uh, reproduction cycle, and another uh, you know, human being is created. So the norm 
is always the popular thing. The norm is creating life from male and female, creating child from male and female. That's the norm that Allah has established. However, things that are out of the ordinary, out of the norm, are singular, not plural. And that is what we need to emphasize to the people of the book when we're teaching this point. That look, how many people were created like Adam in this whole world? How many people like Eve were created in this world? How many people like Jesus were created in this world? In other words, how many people were created without a father in this world? How many people were created without a mother in this world? How many people were created without a father and a mother in this world? And the answer is simple, one. Because singular or odd, the odd is always against the norm, against the society. The norm of society is that everybody is going to be born from a father and mother. So now why do these odds or singular things happen? They happen to show the majesty, the authority, the power of God, the power of Allah, that Allah is all powerful. The biggest thing we can tell the pastors and the priests in the church, that if God did not send Jesus or did not create Jesus this way, then God would not be God. I always say that in my uh, dialogues and conversations with them in Dawah. And they get shocked. What do you mean by God will not be God if Jesus was not born? I said, yes, because if God is restricted and limited to creating life through only one way, then he's not really God. The whole purpose of being omnipotent, the whole, the whole meaning of the ayah in the Quran, Allahu Samad. Allahu Samad means what? He's, he's omnipotent. He's unlimited. He's infinite. He has no restriction. If God is restricted to create life through only a father and a mother, then he's no, not qualified to be God at all. We should not be worshipping that God that, go, that can only create life from a male and a female. We should be worshipping Allah or God who can create life however he wants, whichever way he wants, whatever he wants to do. So that shows the infinity of God. That shows the uh, unlimited nature or being and all-powerful. When we say that Allah is Al-Qawi, Al-Aziz, Zul-Quwwat al madin these are all names and sifat of Allah to show. And that is what we need to highlight in this whole predicament of, of Isa ibn Maryam, the birth of Isa ibn Maryam, which they have made a big taboo that, okay, it's just the son of God. God sent his only begotten son for the help of mankind and, you know, blah, 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 and all that. So we need to show this from a different paradigm, a different paradigm shift we need to do for them to make them realize and appreciate God and love God and love his power, his authority. Yes, he has done this for a reason and a purpose. And that is what Prophet Muhammad Sallam came to highlight in, in the world, that my brother Isa ibn Maryam was not just created as a something unusual. There was a purpose behind that. There was a relevance for it. And that was to show the might, mightiness of God, the power of God. And not only that, but Isa al-Islam was a result of a supplication and invocation of his grandmother, the mother of Mary, had dedicated the child for the servitude of mankind, which is mentioned in the Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the dua of the paternal, uh, the maternal grandmother of Isa al-Islam, and he was the result of that dua, that he came in this world. And he is still alive, he was saved and saved alive, and he has unfinished business, meaning his creation was unusual, and his temporary end in the world was unusual. No man, no human being, no living human being has ever been raised up alive. No human being has ever been born without a father. So his beginning and his temporary end, the reason I say temporary because his end has not yet happened. So his beginning and his temporary end were both unusual, out of the box, extraordinary things. But remember, all good things come to an end, like they say. So there is an end also planned by Allah for Isa al-Islam, that when he comes back here on earth and finishes his unfinished business, he has been reserved or preserved or protected for a very big duty and obligation, and that is to kill the, the false messiah, the Dajjal. Can you imagine the magnitude and weightage of the poison and venom of Dajjal that Allah reserved a prophet of his, a prophet of God, to kill the Dajjal, meaning no ordinary human being is made or cut out to kill the Dajjal. Dajjal is so powerful, so extraordinary, so, you know, uh, uh, extra that Allah made Isa to kill the Dajjal. 
and that is his business when he comes back here on earth. And after killing the girl, he will live a normal life, get married, have a family, and then he will die a natural death. And then he will have a grave here on earth, just like all the prophets of God have a grave on earth. Thank you. Allah.